Hi, I'm Mark Jackson, and this is Order Fire. Today I'm sitting out with my good friends, Greg and Sabrina Collier, owners of The Yoke in Rock Hill and At Dawn here in Arsley Place. I met Greg a few years back when he interviewed for a position at my restaurant Uptown, and I was immediately struck by his curious nature. I'm looking forward to seeing what these past few years have done to that and what his take is on the industry now that he's a successful owner of two locations. I'm interested to see what he has to say about trading in uh, the uh, high style life of Fagua for the unglamorous life of the egg and what that's like. I think you'll enjoy. Chef Greg and Sabrina Collier come from Memphis, Tennessee, where Greg's first real memories of cooking were his grandmother making her famous butter rolls. She would never reveal the recipe, but he knew then that someday he wanted to make people feel the same way she made him feel about those rolls. After finding an even deeper culinary passion while working at a popular hot wing restaurant in Memphis, Greg decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona and attend culinary school. After graduation, he honed his cooking skills working at some of the finest area resorts including the Phoenician, the Arizona Biltmore, and the Westin Kirlin. In 2012, he and Sabrina decided they wanted to move back to the South and open a place of their own. With the Yoke in Rock Hill, South Carolina, their goal was to create a new special place focused on local food resources but with a touch of contemporary flair. With an already loyal following, Greg and Sabrina opened a second location called At Dawn across the border in Charlotte. With his beloved Tennessee fries, out of this world pancakes, and endlessly creative brunch specials, Greg and Sabrina continue to bring breakfast to a whole new level. Greg, good to see you. Good to see you Sabrina. Hi. Thank you for having us out. Hello. Thank you. All right, brother. Well, this is kind of, for me, this is, I've, I've been looking forward to this one because you are one of the few people that came through my kitchen but never worked for me. Yeah, man, I'm really looking forward to it too. Me as well. Um, you came through Halcyon, gosh, right at a time when the South was about ready to blow up. Oh yeah, man, like, it was we about had, to pop. Like I think everybody, it seems like all of us knew it, right? That yeah. like we had to go there. Um, and you were coming in from? Um, from Phoenix, Arizona, working the um, resort scene. All the five star, five diamond, fruit, fruit, food shit. Mm -hmm. You say fruit, 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 shit. So fruit, fruit, fruit. fruit let me say it. Fruit, fruit, food, shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> so tweezers, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Tweezers, gold spoons, uh, fucking palais knives, and uh, sharpening kicks. Just the whole thing. How did you guys end up in Arizona? Because you're from Tennessee. Oh man, yeah. So at some point in my life i was working at the hot wing spot i worked at the hot wing spot from like 2003 to 2005 and then i was like yo i like this shit. i want to take it serious i want to do something and i decided to go to the place that was the least like memphis that i could find phoenix arizona specifically scottsdale that's the least like memphis it's like opposite it's nothing like memphis bro it's crazy when i moved there i had a roommate i met the roommate on craigslist this dude left the door open and i'll say he said man the door's open i said what do you mean the door's open he says it's open <laughs> the fuck you mean the doors open? He's like, nah, it's open, man. Just walk in, put your stuff in. It's cool. And I knew then that I was there somewhere else. That's that's some other world stuff. That's right? yeah. fantastic. It was the best <laughs> thing ever. I was like, oh my god, the doors open. <laughs> and were you with him at that point? No, we hadn't started dating. So I met Greg at the hot wing spot. I was in college at a Catholic university around the corner from where he worked, and he was kind of kind of the obnoxious guy that leaned over. I think he like flirted with every girl that came in through the, the little <laughs> the little window from the back. And um, he would kind of flirt, you know, through the little window or whatever. And I wasn't, I, I didn't, wasn't interested at the time. And over time he became my friend. We started dating when he was gone. When I saw he was going to culinary school, and he was done being a weed head, I was like, okay, I can take Almost you serious. Done. I can take Almost you serious done. now. When he said, I'm moving to Arizona, and at first I thought he was just BS. I left. When he really left and drove a, a Buick, an old Buick from Memphis to Arizona. 98 Buick with Sabre Green, <laughs> blue velvet seat. And he was like, I'm going to culinary school. When he decided to do that, I was like, okay, he's, 
he's serious, he's gonna go. And I moved there a year later. So I left Nashville, I was in Nashville at the time. Mm -hmm. And I left Nashville and moved there with him. And I was like, well, here goes nothing, we'll see, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Arizona, at that point, he had really gotten into the culinary scene. So he was in culinary school. He had opened up, uh, helped open up the Monte Lucia kitchen. It was like a new resort they had. And I knew then he loved it because he would breathe it, talk about it. I'd hear about whatever happened at the resort that day. That's the first job kitchen. I ever got fired from too. Like I didn't even go back and get my knife kit. I was so hurt about it. I just went, I just went. Call her, got in the car, and when I got in the car, I called my mom. I called my mom, and I just started crying. Yeah, that's the first time I saw him cry. We had been dating. I had never seen him, and I was like, he loves this because he was really, like, snot crying. What, like, you said snot crying? Yeah, crying. he was snot crying. So, so why were you crying, though? <laughs> Man, because, like, take it personal? Because yes. it was the first time I had, I had put all of me into something, mm -hmm. and I didn't get all of that back. And it, like, it threw me because I thought, you know, you give all of yourself to something. I mean, you get something back. And they just gave me a check for two weeks and let me go. And I was like, like, what did I do? Right. And the dude was like, nothing. I was like, so what, what happened? What did I do? He was like, nothing. It's just the way these things work. And I knew then, like, I was like, okay, I got to figure out something else because I can't play this game. And I, that, that made me understand how serious I took it. And I think that made her understand how serious I took it too. Cause it was like, she was like, yo, he is hurt by this, by letting go, of, by losing this cooking job. And I mean, I got another job and it was, it turned into the most important job. The, the job I, fired, I got fired from wasn't really important, but the job I got next turned into the most important job of my career. How so? It was the breakfast place. Ah. It was the place where I went, we got a, I got a job, I was like, okay, we need a breakfast guy. Mm -hmm. You can come in, cook pancakes, do French toast and stuff. And I was like, all right, cool, I can do it. This was the Phoenician, correct? Yeah, it was at the Phoenician at El Terrazzo. This guy kept coming to work late. I mean, like 28 days straight. Late? Late. And then one number like 10, 15 minutes, but late is late. Right. And they kept telling me, yo, this dude's about to get out of here. And then he, he, one day, he wasn't there. They told me to work eggs today. And I was like, I ain't never worked this. It's Friday. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And I just, I, they, I kept I kept working them. And then it turned into a thing where I was trying to be better than everybody else on this station. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to kill cats that had been working there for three years, dudes that they had coming from brunch, working breakfast. I was like, yeah, I'm about to kill this dude today. So it turned <laughs> into a thing for me. that I was like, I'm going to be better than every single person in this restaurant at eggs and breakfast. Mm -hmm. And nobody's going to be able to touch me. Let's One clarify day, that he hated it that I heard about this. No, no, I didn't hate it at first. I hated it he once hated I eggs. thought I proved my point and I couldn't get to the next step. I heard about eggs all the time. I don't want to do eggs. I want to go to dinner. And they let a new guy go to dinner. Like, he was so adamant. He was tired of doing eggs. I was 27. It was game on for me. And I knew <laughs> that from the time so I was So I was trying there. to kill these kids. Like, I was like, and I'm from Memphis, and we talk a lot of shit anyway, so I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> bro, come on. I'm like, I'm flipping eggs, posting eggs. I'm halfway cooking this dude's station, and not because I had to, just because I'm trying to, to prove a point off. that I can really, really cook. So Yeah, it was to show off. But I heard about eggs a lot. I was like, yo, why you got all these dudes coming in? Work them a couple weeks on lunch, they go to dinner. Work them a couple weeks on breakfast, they go to dinner. Work on breakfast, work on lunch, they go to dinner. I said, how you passing me? He said, man, a dude told me, once you get a guy who can cook eggs, you don't let him go. And I looked at this man, and he was dead serious. And I was like, I took it as a compliment, but I hated him. I was like, you, so you knew I had this skill set and this skill level, and you kept me just because I could cook eggs? Peace. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him my two weeks, and I was out there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's when we left and did the Charleston thing, so. But you were, you were only in Charleston for? Two months. Uh, my parents were there, and at that point, when Greg couldn't cook, I saw him, the first time I saw my husband just go into, like, he was just depressed because he couldn't cook. Charlotte was always the move, but her parents were in Charleston at the time, so. That was like our middle ground, yeah, like, until we get ourselves Two ready. hours, we can drive, I can have interviews. I drove up a couple days, do interviews. I was trying to schedule, like, stages on Friday, Saturday. After a couple of those, I was like, man, I can't. I, I can't, I can't do, I gotta do my own. There's no way I can do anybody else. There's no way, like, there's a lot of good dudes, there's a lot of good possibilities, there's a lot of good opportunities money-wise, but I had to do me. It was yeah. just time. So my parents at first were like, I don't know what idea they had or how much they thought it cost to open a restaurant. <laughs> they were like, we're gonna give you $11,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. Uh, <laughs> and, and you guys make it work. So Greg was like, whatever. 
I'll do it. And then as money started running out, we're like, yeah, we need more. And so it ended up being like twenty two thousand. And that's and that's eleven K. No working capital. That's eleven K no inventory. Yep. That's just eleven K paying ten thousand dollars for the stuff that's in the building. Yeah. Yep. And then having a thousand left over by painting stuff and saying, Well look, we don't even I don't even have food to cook. I gotta get food. We so. we found this Greg found the first yoke. This little shoddy spot on Craigslist. We find everything on Craigslist, my dad. <laughs> but we found the first yoke on Craigslist. And Greg was like, well, let's go check it out. It's in this place called Rock Hill. And I was like, what the hell is Rock Hill? What kind of hill, Billy, <laughs> bad place is this? We pull into this little just rundown, shitty spot. And they still have, the place has been closed a year. There's still hot dogs on the grill. Like for nine months. Hot dogs on the grill, butter in the butter rollers. It was insane. Buns open. <laughs> uh, Golly sauce. <laughs> My jaw was like a bum. Like, and, and I walked in, and the first thing we said was, yeah, we got to do breakfast. Because we it saw wasn't the even, diner. Like, yeah, so it's a diner style place, and I was like, it's no way I'm going to ever be able to do a tasting menu in this place. People mm -hmm. are not going to get it. People are not going to get this breakfast that we're about to do, mm -hmm. so it's no way they're going to get anything else. We got to do breakfast. I got to do grits and eggs. Got to. As a cook, I value proper cooking. So the most important thing for me was to just come in, figure out how I can make the best bowl of grits. Okay, that's easy. When I was younger, my grandma used to eat country ham and grits. How can I take that concept of ham and grits and make it better? I went to culinary school, make a smoked ham stock, cook the grits with smoked ham stock. I'm from Tennessee. We put milk and butter in our grits. Everybody does it. I don't know anybody that doesn't put milk and butter in our grits. So take the ham stock, take the milk, take the butter, take some salt cook the grits. Now I need good grits. What's the best grits? Definitely not Quaker. Got to get coarse on. So you go through the process of trying to figure out how to evolve an idea of, of all the grits and just make it good. So that's what we did. Cook grits slow. Um, add the ham stock. Add seasoning. Use technique to just cook a good bowl of grits. How can I cook better eggs than somebody who knows how to cook over easy eggs? You got to get better product. So those were the two jumping out points of trying to figure out how to make a great restaurant. Well, you built good relationships with farmers down there that hadn't built relationships with anybody really in the restaurant industry yet, right? Yeah, so I don't think Rock Hill, I don't think people in Rock Hill who own restaurants thought it mattered to do. For me, it was important just because I knew they had better product, if nothing else, better product. And I also knew that if I could figure out a way to connect with a place that I don't have anything to do with, we'd win. Mm -hmm. So we put out a Facebook ad and said, hey, we need stuff. I know you told me about uh, Courtney and Ben at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. They started bringing us eggs down, which was awesome. But I was trying to figure out, they're not from here. Nobody in Rock Hill or York County really said anything. Um, the Pinnell said something, hey, we got tomatoes. And I was like, oh, shit, I love tomatoes. Yes. Went down mm -hmm. to the barn, and they had all these tomatoes set up on this like uh, these two picnic tables. She just had cutting boards out. She said, Go ahead, Tastes and we just started want. cutting them and eating tomatoes. Like I was in there like a fucking, not a kid at the candy store. That's too easy. Like I was in there like a, like a fat guy in a vat of bacon fat. Maybe. Like I was in there like oh, all these tomatoes. Like I was, it was, it was, it was amazing because I didn't even know. Like I didn't even know that tomatoes could taste different on a base level, let alone look different, feel different, have a different texture, and all that stuff. So that was kind of the beginning of trying to think outside of grits and eggs. Cause we did specials like strawberry season. We did French toast with strawberries and almond whipped cream. And I wasn't even trying to build flavors. I was just trying to present stuff that people hadn't had before. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I take a bowl of grits and do something else with it? Well, I got sweet potatoes. I'll make sweet potato grits. Instead of doing bacon, I'll see if I can do some braised pork belly. People will be okay with it. Um, trying to figure out, can I make a vegetarian version of pho? I had just had pho. Trying to do just, random general ideas about stuff that I could present with eggs so I can call it breakfast, but it's not really breakfast. It's just putting eggs on stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it just was, making holiday sauces, oh, you know what I'm sorry. saying? And well. it was easing Rock Hill in. Rock Hill was, uh, Rock Hill reminds me of, I guess you can say like our parents. Like our parents are kind of <laughs> set in their ways. So my folks still eat well done steaks, you know, stuff sure. like that. And so Rock Hill was easing them into something different. So we started off with the basics. We have the grits, we have the pancakes, we have the waffles. 
but we may throw in, you throw in like a French toast, I don't know, a French toast pancake, and they, they, they may recognize French toast and pancake, and that'll be good enough for them, so I'll try it. Mm -hmm. Then you start throwing out, he started throwing out crazier stuff, different, more creative stuff, but at first, Rock Hill was like, it's like dating. That you had to present yourself as to court something. properly. Oh, we had to court them. We sure. had to court Rock Hill well, you, a lot. Gotta, I mean, you have to build a relationship yeah. and of trust, anyways. It, we would hear a lot. You guys aren't gonna survive our breakfast alone. You're not gonna survive. You gotta do hamburgers, hot dogs, and Greg maybe mm -hmm. tried that for a week or two, and he was like, "I'm not doing this shit. I'm not making hamburgers and hot dogs." He was like, "They're gonna come in. They're gonna like it, and that's gonna be it." And it, it, at some points, it got really hard, but. We heard that a lot. You guys aren't gonna survive off breakfast alone. You just you gotta, can't do it. I made up a nemesis, man. Like, mm -hmm. and it's it's happening here now. And I and there's now we have so much love in the community. There's no like I haven't had. We have some people come in that don't like stuff, but that's just random restaurant stuff. Mm -hmm. My peers, uh, farmers, everyone comes in and they say, "Wow, we really like what you're doing." Um, if it's yo pancakes are the best pancakes I ever had. Biscuit is super on point. Oh, I love the bacon. Oh, I love grits. Then I had the need to prove to people that I was creatively uh, smarter than them. Mm -hmm. For no reason, nobody said anything about it. People, people were hitting me up on Facebook saying, yo, that's sick. I never thought of doing that. And I was like, all right, cool. And I would go and say, whatever. Like, you don't really think that. You don't really feel like that. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that because I had to keep <laughs> pushing know. myself yeah. because I knew, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to work at Halcyon. I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to any of these places to try to make myself a better cook. So I had to figure out a way that I had to make myself a better cook. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just fighting, I'm fighting to win now. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm shadow boxing just so I can get my skill set up because I have to be a better cook than I was yesterday. Like right. it's, it's a, it's a, it's not just a need. Like, like I go to sleep waking up and trying to figure out how I can do days better just because you gotta, you can't do this chef thing and not be waking up trying to be better. You can't keep doing the same thing over. Oh, it upsets me so much when I look at the dudes and I'm like, that's the same thing you had on the menu last year at this time of year. You can't keep doing this. These cats that do that for 20, 30 years. Yes, I can't do it for two months. It like. It bothers him. Me and my wife have conversations where I'm so infuriated with people thinking I'm supposed to still be doing Oreo pancakes. I did that, I'm done. I'm done. I woke up one day and I said, oh, Oreo pancakes. I did it. It's done. I'm not doing it again. Yeah. And that's the difference between him and myself. He's more, I want to do what I want to do. So I understand the consistency need and I also have to cater to his creativity. So that's where it, we usually try to intersect, but sometimes my husband is like, I'm not doing it. So he just repeated a special for the first time in four years maybe over here when we first opened up and it was like pulling teeth to get him to do that. The tiramisu pancakes. Kylie, I hate and he didn't want to, and that was our big break. <laughs> that was our big break. That was the mm -hmm. first time we got, um, the tiramisu pancakes were in the newspaper, our first newspaper article. I fucked and, up all my dad's plans of playing yeah. football at UT and becoming a doctor and going to the NFL. I fucked yeah. all that up. <laughs> yeah, his dad had his plan. He's supposed to be an engineer. I was supposed to be a pharmacist. I was supposed to be specifically a biomedical engineer so I could get my degree as a doctor. And I know why. Mm -hmm. He grew up in the civil rights era. I know why. Our parents But I was like, nah, man. He cooked. My pops cooked at uh, Bonanza on Elvis Presley Road, a mile away from Graceland, which was the craziest kitchen ever back in the 70s. Right when Elvis died, right. they were always at this place. And he cooked grill. He was like, nah, you're not doing that. You're not cooking. No way you cooking. He didn't want him. No to way you cooking. And he did landscaping and cooking. He was like, no way. And we didn't even have, we didn't even talk about it. But now though, when I open a spot, he's always like, yo, uh, what y'all used to clean the grill? I'm like, uh, this chemical in a grill brick. He's like, I y'all use lemons? I was like, that is 2010. <laughs> lemons? You mean lemon like, <laughs> you want me to scrape this thing with lemons? Nah, man. It's, that's 30 That's years old. Our parents are real old school. Like yeah, he's an old school dude. He cleaned the grill with lemons. Like they come from like the civil rights <laughs> era. White Haven is the area where like Graceland and stuff mm -hmm. is now. So back then, White Haven was now literally it's, White Haven. Now it's White Haven. <laughs> yeah. it's called, but now it's Black Haven. We call it Black Haven. At that point, his day. dad was like the only black kid. Um, my dad went to school around the corner at Hillcrest. He was mm -hmm. like one of the few black kids. So their time when is started. different. Yeah, when the busing, the the whole thing. Yeah. So our parents have a different view. So when they came in 
and they see all these, as they say, white people waiting outside for eggs. <laughs> they're like, what the, his dad was like, they doing all that for eggs? His dad couldn't believe it. I think he was shocked, he was proud because he was like, yeah, I do eggs, but you know, I do this, I do that, and. I didn't care about none of that, because you know what he got? Chicken, waffles, eggs. Yep. That's what your dad My got. pops came in for four no. days. He and ate, chicken and waffles they every ate day. breakfast there, got chicken and waffles. They came back, got waffles for lunch. Yep. Came in the morning, same thing, chicken and waffles, waffles for lunch. And when they left and got on the road, he said, hey, do me a favor. Cook me about a 20 piece. And I was like, Pops, I don't work at the highway spot no more. He was like, well, just cook me a 20 piece, make some hot, make some season. And they took chicken <laughs> on the road back yeah. home. And, but for me, though, as the kid, it's like, yo, they really like this. Shit. Like, yeah, they like the chicken. Yeah, they like the waffles. Yeah, they like the eggs. But they like this so much that they had to take it with them and go home and have conversations with people about this specifically. Yeah. And it was almost, I know, for my parents, unknown to see. Um, it, like uh, the diversity we had because usually we're gonna throw it out there when black people own a restaurant it's soul food it's caribbean it's something that's closer to like your what they it's what something people that you think people heritage. like you gonna buy from you yeah so it's easy it's like seeing an asian person make latin cuisine you're mm -hmm. gonna look at it kind of like and i'm like we eat breakfast too you know we eat breakfast too <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like we eat eggs it might be a little late but we still eat breakfast we too. still eat breakfast so <laughs> Of all the questions. <laughs> I can't believe you even wanted that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, you can. We eat, you know, so people will come in and say, is this a soul food spot? And that would probably, probably grind my gears a little. You talk about honest. another nemesis? The okay. other nemesis is the stereotypical person who I really haven't met before. Mm -hmm. The stereotypical person <laughs> who makes me cook uh, soul food. I don't even know who this person is. Um... <laughs> But that person pisses me off. So this nemesis, though, this nemesis lives in your head? Yeah, I mean, all of them do. It was you just talk about the areas. expectations. If you're going to be a black owner and a black cook, because yeah. you can't, you can't be a chef sure. and be black anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, man, and this is the thing, man. I have a, it's a, I, that's a, that's a double-edged sword. I hate cats that come out and don't do enough work and call themselves chefs. But I also hate the fact that I, like, I never worked for a black chef. Mm -hmm. Ever, which to a lot of people may be like shocking. Like you know, work for a black chef? Why not? There's a lot of black chefs. Eh. How many in Charlotte? Five. How many were in Arizona? How many cats that really went to culinary school or have the equivalent knowledge mm -hmm. to call themselves a chef in Charlotte that are black? Let's say ten. I don't know all ten of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I know Mike Bowler. I know Jamie. Right off the top of my head, I can't think of it anymore. Like the the pastry chef at uh Bonterra now is a black lady. Yep. Um I haven't met her yet. Right, and they say she's a beast too. That's what I, I have. haven't met her. And this and the, and the thing is, I mean, I know why it's just, it's the same ratio of people. Minorities are thirteen percent. Um, I get it. So it's like that in the kitchen. But the thing for me is, like I bust my ass to get to a point to let people know that I can cook. I, black chef who cooks grits and eggs. I can actually cook. That's the same nemesis. That's the same evil person that I got to fight to prove a point to. Then nobody really care. People was coming in because we were black on. People was coming in because it was the best grits they ever had or they heard that we had chicken and waffles that was better than Gladys Knight's. I didn't really care why people was coming in and spending money. But once they got in and had the conversation, certain people were like, my pops and my mom's. All right, cool. It's cool that you're doing uh, a smoked Gouda gravy to do biscuits and gravy without bacon in it. But fuck that though. When you do the biscuits and gravy with bacon in it, I'm there. I'm there for mm -hmm. that. Because if you cook that like you cook any of this other stuff, I'm there. I'm there so you yeah. got those people, and I, I'm, 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 I'm extremely happy for every customer that we get that enjoys our food and enjoys the service and get it. But I'm even more happy when I get a young black kid come in and try to special. It's like, yo, that's the best thing I ever had. Yep. That gets me. Because I wasn't eating that when I was a young black kid. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are 30, 20, 50, and 70, and still don't eat that. So for me, it's important to let people know that, yo, I'm a black chef and I can cook. I, like, I could go to the French Laundry and hold my own, just like I could go to Nana's and hold my own, just like I could go to uh, Lawan's and hold my own, just like I could go to Denny's and hold my own, because I can actually cook and I have a skill set and I feel like it's important for people to understand that when you look at me and you see me, the first thing you see me is that I'm tall, I'm black, I'm big, and I'm focused on what I'm doing. But I can cook. Like that's the 
that's the name of the book. Mm -hmm. That's it. I cook. There's a challenge in me being not only his wife, but his partner and the front of the house manager because sometimes when he's on his creative like rant, I have to deal with you know him saying, "I need this right now. Go find me a, a, a purple inside purple sweet potato. Just go find one because I need it for this." And I'm the one. You know, when he gets in that mode, I have to go find it from somewhere. Like I had to drive an hour to go get one. Like a, like three of them just for a special that he just said. I'm he glad you're grimacing. Have. Because <laughs> like, I am. That, that's I'm like, exactly. Ooh, ooh, it sounds different right now, don't it? <laughs> that's what it is. So that's that's now, one thing. I could do it without her, and that's that's. She drives me insane. For me, that's the small <laughs> thing. Like, I mean, and and her is bigger, but for me, going to drive and picking up something, that's yeah, I need you to do that. But the big stuff though is, like the other day, man, I had a break. Like it was some stuff going on at the restaurant at the Yoke that I didn't like. Um, I just, it just, it just wasn't what we do. And I had a huge problem with it. And when I got home, I like my stress level was so high, I kind of like had a, like a quick breakdown. And then she just like, I was like, I thought I was done. Like it was bad for me and she just held me. She said, you ain't gotta go nowhere, I got you. And I sat there and she just held me while I was on the ground on my knees, like breaking. And she just was like, yo, you good. It's like, you know, like you knew, you know this is what you do. Like you good, you good. I have to talk And I was good. It. And like I, after that, I was good. I was like, yo, I am good. Like I'm, I'm okay. And I couldn't, I can't see another woman, person. Like I can't nobody else do that for me. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I married her because I loved her and I didn't even see all that coming. I didn't see the long days, the stress and frustration coming and me having, the, and me need somebody to help me get through that. Mm -hmm. She helps me get through that. Well, there's, Hey man, fuck them. Let's go get a margarita. Yeah. Whether it's something simple as that <laughs> or something simple as holding me and letting and just letting letting me let go on her. And like, yo, I got you. Like if don't nobody else got you, like I got you. you know this what is coming this is coming from a woman that's dealing with you seven days a week and y'all work together. This coming from a woman who I just got on nerves today. Like she's just like, yo, <laughs> do your job, I'm gonna do my job. That coming from, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She still she got me. You know what I'm saying? That's I tell dudes all the time, I tell Mike, man, you got to make sure somebody's got you. If you don't have somebody to get you, to got your back in here, outside, when you're dealing with the stresses, when you're trying to figure out, man, why why am I doing this and people not looking at me and this other dude doing half this and they looking at him, you got to have somebody to get you, to, to pull your ego down when it needs to be pulled down and to throw it up when it needs to be thrown up. Yeah. You got to have it. It's not you can't win without that. being married to a chef in general. I'm mm -hmm. sure your wife knows it's not easy, but oh, having to work with you guys, <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy because I used to yeah. tell Greg at first, w when we were in Arizona, it was like he had another woman in the kitchen. Like, I didn't see him on Christmas, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. I was like, you got another family? No, he's at work. So that's, he why it's to called, work that's why you're called restaurant widows. That's exactly what it is because I have to share my husband with them now at least we're sharing this thing together and I still, you know, I, I may not like she you for the eight hours. Now. I guess I get to feel it, but I also get to be, you know, you know, his wife and the partner. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy, but it, when I'm stressed out, he has to come and tell me, hey, babe, pull back, you know, do this. And I try to do that for him, too. Because, Bubba, let's go get a margarita. Yeah, it seems like <laughs> like at times you guys are just as much as you have to deal with people and staff. You're also like a recluse because you're in your Oh my! Is it? It's it's kind of like being married to an oversized toddler, and not just you specifically. Yes. Yes. In because, general, being married to a chef is like being yeah. married to an oversized and, toddler. And, and, is it's all ego, because right? It's and you, it's ego. It's ego. I don't yeah. think you could be a great chef without some ego, because at some point you got to give, you got to care so much about this food to get to the next level. Like you get to a point that, like you said, dudes did do paperwork for 20 years and that's all they ever want to do because they got a job and they got benefits and it's done. For, like, you have to, I'm still at a place to where I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to stop. Right. Like, I don't know, I don't know what, it, I don't know what the stopping point looks like, um, but right now it's like, I, I still don't know how much I can do with carrots, for God's sakes. Like, I don't, I haven't even got past trying to figure out what else I can do with the carrot. I don't have another thing. I don't have another, well, I don't really like cooking. There's nothing else. This is the thing that I've moved my whole life for. 
Like, I got a woman that's waiting on me. Or I thought she was waiting on me. At least I was hoping. I was like, I can't fuck this up. Yo, like, I'm about to cook for the rest of my life. And y'all are wasting my time. Y'all go wash these dishes. I got to go home and make this money to pay this rent. Because I, I ain't living with my folks. I didn't get a stipend. I moved to Arizona, man, to go to La Cordon Bleu. They call, they call me, call me, call me, call me, call me. When my financial aid check didn't come in the month I thought, they thought, they stopped calling me. Hmm. And I was like, this is the plan. What yeah. now? So I figured out, I said, I got to do something else. I looked at, I looked at, look, I went to community college. And when I went to community college, they paid, they gave me a grant to go to school. I was like, yo, somebody just paid for this? I'm about to kill it. Like, I'm about to destroy this thing. And I was in class at 7 o'clock, like, like, I just got off work at 5 in the morning. I went in at 6 the other night. And I'm leaning and falling off like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Rue? Yes, sir. Rue? That's like gravy, right? No, it's Rue. Heard. All right, so I'm like, I'm, it's not, a, it, it was, it's never been a game for me. It was always the way I was going to get my, everybody who wanted to get out of the situation they was in out. It was always the way I was going to take care of my family. It was always more than me waking up and going to cook. I got one tattoo, and that's 10. That's the day me and my wife got married, 10, 10, 10. I like tattoos. I'm going to give me some knives and shit on me eventually, but like it wasn't about none of that for me. I was trying to be the best every single day in every single space I was in. If I'm cooking eggs, I want to be better than everybody. If I'm cooking grits, I want to be better than everybody. If I'm washing dishes, I want to be better than everybody because everything that has anything to do with this whole restaurant shit, I got to, like, I can't. What are, we, what, are, what are we doing it for if you're not going to give it the proper service that it deserves? People people died doing this. People killed themselves doing this. People committed suicide. Like, yo, like, this shit is serious. Well, you can go to school now and, you know, get enough tattoos and get a TV show. Or, <laughs> a, or a web series. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Being here hanging with Sean and Chefs, I think that they kind of got that experience, too. And I would like to think that the next time a black dude comes up in the kitchen, that you're going to pause for a minute. Cause he might be me. He you like you might hire me. But instead of trying to figure out why I might have an attitude or why I got dreads or why I might come in smelling like weed because I don't know no better to, to spray myself off or whatever the case is, why one day I'm late and I don't really care that I'm late because I got some house shit going on that you will never understand. I'm mean, those are not excuses that Young chefs, don't do none of that. Don't do none of that stuff I just said don't do. <laughs> but if you do, have that conversation with the chef. Like you gotta have that conversation. And chefs need to understand that, yo, man, don't put every black kid, woman, boy in the same boat that the last dude was in. But take it from me, like, yo, I was that dude. Like, I slept on park benches because I didn't want to stop smoking weed to get a job. And I'm this guy now. Like I'm this guy with this woman with these two restaurants. So so, so don't so pause before you judge. Pause before you do the stereotype. Just back up and look at it. Five second rule is what I used to say in the kitchen when I worked. Yo, before you say anything to me, look around for five seconds. Tattoos, dreads, black tall. I can't have them in my kitchen. Five second rule. Talk to him. Ask him why he started cooking. Ask him how his folks are. Ask him where you're from. Ask him what his favorite thing to cook is. Ask him what his favorite cookbook is. Ask him something other than what you're about to ask everybody on the application when you hire people. You know what I'm saying? Pause, do something different, and you might get a great cook. Yeah. So where'd your boo go? <laughs> my, my boo had work stuff to do, man. Payroll, all that good stuff. So she had to go down to Rock Hill and handle that. So she is done. She said she, thank y'all. She loves everyone. <laughs> I would Especially do, you. Oh, you. I'm Cinderella way. She loves you guys. <laughs> we building this to a place to where it's going to be so valuable that somebody's going to offer us something stupid for it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say, thank you for giving us this money. And we're going to take it and we're going to do what the hell we want to do for the rest of our lives. So, What would you do? Oh, man, I'm getting a farm in 30 seats. 30 seat restaurant. Um, I really. Wow, you really want to lose money? Yeah, man. <laughs> You're like, I want to. And I, and, I, and I know getting a 30 seat restaurant doing like a nine course tasting is not gonna make me rich, but I wanna just break even and cook how I wanna cook for the rest of my life. I like, I wanna go get some kids who really wanna cook and teach them how to cook from the dirt all the way up. Um, I'm big about control, as most of us are. 
I want to be able to grow the food, raise the food, take it out of the soil, control the soil. I want to be able to control the environment around the soil. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, I like to get kids, especially kids, my kids, like, I need to get kids in the hood to know that they can grow. Like, what one thing that I learned about cooking is that creating is a gift that we all get, but creating and giving sustenance, though, you can't beat that. Yeah. So if I can teach a kid, man, who think he has no options, that, yo, you can create. You can give life and happiness. And you don't have to do it by whatever means that you think. It don't have to be, hey, I got all these girls. It don't have to be all these dudes want me. You can actually grow food and give to people and and sustain life. You can do that. I think if I catch kids young enough, that'll turn a lot of tides. If dudes, I know dudes that stole food because they mom was a crackhead and they pops was selling crack, so they weren't giving them no food. So they had to steal food from the store or come eat at my house. So if that kid could grow food now, the thought process of getting out is different because yeah. you can grow food. So now, do you really have to go steal food? Nah, because you can grow food. It ain't Cheetos, but it's carrots. And I say this all the time, and it's, really, it's not about me not wanting to give my knowledge to any other race. It's not about me feeling uh, that they don't, that they are not people who are disenfranchised of every creed, color, age group. What it's about is I have an opportunity to, to be that person that I was looking for when I was coming up. Yeah. I have an opportunity to, when, when I felt like I didn't have another option but to sleep outside to say, hey, look, man, you can grow some vegetables to make some money if you really want to make some money. Now, it ain't the fast money, it ain't flashy, but you can make some money from this. You really can make money from farming. And you can feed yourself and you can feed your family. Base level, feed your family. Greg, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you having us here today on your day off, making some breakfast and uh, spending some time with us today. Thank y'all for coming and hanging out, man. It was super fun. Hell yeah, it was. Can we do it again, but like not an episode, because I don't want to be like the dude that's taking over everybody's episodes. <laughs> I'm going to just come. Can I just come to everybody else's episode? All right, I'm going to just come to the next guy. Who's the next guy? You can be okay. my new, you can be like my Ed McMahon. Yo, but then the ratio, it's going to be too diverse. No, actually, it balances out. Uh, but that's too diverse. Oh, yeah. It you're can't right. be equal. No, because then it's the. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs>